Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak to the Congress. Um, it's a pleasure to be following Cathy Lord's excellent introduction to DSM-5. I'm going to be describing a model, a psychological model, uh, of autism spectrum conditions, which I think maps very nicely onto the new uh, two-domain approach that DSM-5 is taking. How do we advance the slides here? Okay, so um, this first uh, slide just introduces uh, a lot of names who are collaborators in the research I'm going to describe. There are two groups, largely. Uh, the first group are psychologists and those involved in imaging, and the second looking at the role of hormones and genetics, and I'm particularly pleased to pick out um, in the uh, group looking at hormones uh, the name of Liliana Ruta, who's a child psychiatrist working in Catania here at the hospital, um, who's been um, collaborating with us in the role of hormones. As I've mentioned, uh, the model I'm going to describe is a two-factor model to try to characterize at a psychological level um, individuals on the autistic spectrum. And the argument is that any individual who ends up receiving a diagnosis of any level of severity um, on the autistic spectrum should have below average empathy alongside of intact or even above average systemizing. So let's describe each of these. Thank you. Um, the first is uh, empathy, and it's a, a term that we're all familiar with. Some people have uh, suggested uh, that it has at least two components, although there may be many more fractions of empathy but at the very least two have been picked out. The first is a cognitive one, defined as the drive to identify another person's thoughts and feelings, putting yourself into someone else's shoes to imagine what they might think or feel. The second is an affective one, the drive to respond with an appropriate emotion to somebody else's thoughts and feelings. And the idea is that below average empathy uh, might underlie the behaviors that we see that make up um, the diagnosis uh, of autism spectrum in these areas in, in terms of social relationships, communication, and imagining other people's minds. So it's trying to get at psychological processes underlying behavior. But systemizing is a very different kind of process this is defined as the drive to analyze or build a system, any kind of system. And uh, here I've listed some of the common types of system in the environment. Could be a mechanical system like a computer. It could be a natural system like the weather. Could be an abstract system like mathematics or a taxonomic system, a collection. Uh, where you're trying to systematically organize information. In these two um, images I've included here, we've got, um, on the one hand, um, a photocopy from a man with Asperger, um, a notebook that he fills in every night at midnight in his garden, where he's systematically recording information about the weather. And you can see in uh, very neat columns. He's putting the month, the date, and information about rainfall, about temperature, wind speed, and other meteorological variables. This is just his narrow interest, and he goes out at exactly the same time, in exactly the same place every night, to systemize the weather. And he's not doing it professionally, he's doing it because that is his, his interest. And we can see at the bottom there the familiar sight of a child with autism lining things up in strict order, uh, in this case toy vehicles with very specific colors, 
um, and a child who gets very upset if their system is changed. So that's what I mean by systemizing. And the idea that individuals on the autistic spectrum may have intact or even very strong systemizing is meant to explain a different set of behaviors. Um, the very uh, good attention to detail that we see in people with autism, their narrow interests, focusing often on systems, but also their repetitive behavior or resistance to change. And that's simply because when you systemize, what you're trying to do is identify the rules of the system in order to predict how the system works. And repetition is the only way that you can confirm whether you've identified the rules correctly. If you get the same result every time, then you've identified a rule. So re repetitive behavior, far from being seen as um, necessarily a problem in this model, is actually seen as part of the cognitive style towards good systemizing. And I was, um, by coincidence, um, thinking when I saw Kathy's video of the little boy throwing plates on the table over and over again, that Richard Feynman, um, the Nobel um, physicist, uh, described in his autobiography that he spent his whole PhD spinning plates in the canteen in the university department just because he was fascinated by the pattern of spinning plates. So repetitive behavior doesn't need to be purposeless. It can be because people are interested in how systems work. So what we're looking at is a two-factor theory. And to make things a bit more complicated, each of these um, processes, empathy and systemizing, we can think of as a dimension, again, picking up on the the new way of thinking. Um, so a bell curve or a normal distribution of individual differences in empathy or systemizing. We're going to be trying to, to plot individuals on at least two dimensions. And towards the end of the talk, I'll show you our effort to try to combine the two dimensions into one space. So in terms of empathy, what's the evidence for impaired or below average empathy in autism. Well, many of you will know this test called the reading the mind in the eyes test. This is the child version, uh, which we've used with people with autism who've got good language, um, good intelligence, but still to see whether we can pick up on um, deficits in, uh, in being able to read emotions or read mental states from faces. And here you can see that on this task, where you have to pick which of the four phrases surrounding the photo best describes what the person in the photo thinks or feels, uh, people with um, Asperger's syndrome are performing lower than typical uh, children in uh, scoring on this task. Here the, the, the person is meant to be interested in something. We can also use questionnaires to assess empathy. This is the empathy quotient, but the child version, where the parent fills it in about their child. You can see two uh, items from this questionnaire, uh, and the parent simply says whether they agree or disagree with each statement as a description of their child. And here what we see is that children on the autistic spectrum are scoring lower than typical boys and girls on this test of, of, of empathy. We notice also that typical, let me go back, that typical girls are scoring slightly higher um, than typical boys in terms, of self, uh, in terms of parent reported empathy. There are adult versions of these tests, so taking Kathy's point that, um, that assessment has to be age appropriate, as well as IQ appropriate. This is a test for adults using the same method, which word best describes what the person is thinking or feeling. Um, and here we, we see um, the formatting has slightly um, got lost in here, but we see that uh, women score slightly higher than men 22 versus 19 out of a maximum of 25. Uh, and people with 
Asperger's syndrome, these are adults scoring lower than the other two groups. So when you use the right test, you can identify across the autistic spectrum um, impairments in aspects of empathy. And again, this is the adult version of the EQ, the empathy quotient. This time it can be used by the individual themselves if they can read and understand, uh, where they simply say whether they agree or disagree with each statement as a description of them. Um, so here we see that adults with Asperger's syndrome, uh, what will soon be called adults with autism spectrum, um, uh, are scoring lower than typical men and women in terms of self-reported empathy.